through the Bible, so grab yourself a Bible if you can't find one quickly, and let me pray while you're doing that. Our Father, we ask that your Spirit will help us tonight to understand your Word better. We pray that you'll instruct us, encourage us, help us to know what you've promised and fulfilled a little bit better tonight. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, this is the third of three talks about why did God become human? And the first two left a lot of uh, threads untidied up, and this will be even worse. When Jesus was born in Bethlehem, there were lots of other babies born at the same time, as you know. What was special about this baby? How do you know he was different? Uh, as Jesus was preaching, there were other teachers and preachers around in Judea and Galilee. Uh, what's different about this one? There were three people crucified on that day on crosses. Uh, what's the standout about Jesus? How do you distinguish him from the others? In other words, how do we know what it is that God has done in sending Jesus? Now, I said to you last week that whenever God does something, he always explains it. Sometimes when he does something, he explains it in advance. So, for example, with the Exodus, when Moses sees the burning bush, God speaks to him from the bush and gives an explanation, a partial explanation, of what's about to happen. Uh, you'll see, the, remember the famous story of David and Goliath. In the middle of the story, when David is speaking to Goliath, the explanation of what the story means is in the middle of the story, not in advance, but in the middle of the story. And David says, this is about that there is a God in Israel who saves not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's. That's the second way God explains things, sometimes in advance, sometimes during it, and sometimes after. So when you get to Deuteronomy chapter 4, actually the first eight, eight chapters or so of Deuteronomy, Moses is saying, uh, has any nation ever experienced anything like this? Has a God ever taken a nation out of another nation? Has he ever revealed himself like this? So uh, the, the, the explanation of the Exodus after the event is there's more information there as to what it means. Okay, that's kind of the, the general idea. When God does stuff, he explains it before and during and after. Not always all of those, but at least one of them. But in the case of Jesus, all of them. So the explanation of the Son of God becoming human, Jesus, the Son of Mary being born, all of his life, death and resurrection, how do we make sense of what that means? Well, God has set out a very ornate, detailed, long story to give us a huge explanation before the event happens. He does this by setting up patterns and figures. For example, in the Old Testament, there are a series of events that happen, like the Exodus, where God is revealing something which later on will be used as a reference point for prophets to explain what is happening with Jesus. So, for example, in Exodus 33, uh, this is one of the famous passages of, of Moses going up the mountain, Exodus 33, verse uh, 12. Uh, Moses is uh, already, I think, realised that his job's far too difficult because the people he's leading are a cantankerous lot. So, Exodus 33, 12, Moses said to the Lord, you've been telling me lead these people but you've not let me know whom you'll send with me. You've said, I know you by name, and you've found favour with me. If you are pleased with me, teach me your ways, so I may know you and continue to find favour with you. Remember that this nation is your people. The Lord replied, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. So part of the explanation of what's going on in the Exodus is about God being with his people. There are a variety of other things, of course. So there's, there are uh, symbols, uh, patterns that are set up in the Old Testament which are used later to explain the future. So the people of God, the tabernacle itself, um, tabernacle is where God, the tent is where God comes and meets and lives with his people. Uh, the whole priestly service, I guess epitomised by Leviticus 16 on the Day of Atonement, but a huge host of other rituals, all to do with forgiveness and access to God and who can come close to God and on what terms. Uh, the kingship is a really big deal in the Old Testament. 
Uh, and there are special people like Moses and David and a variety of other people. Uh, the other thing that's there as part of the pattern are the covenants. So the big covenant in Genesis 12, which kind of is uh, foundational to understand the whole Bible, Genesis 12 is this promise to Abram to make him a great nation. This is Genesis 12, verse 2 onwards. Make his name great, make him a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. It's a little recurrent thing. Uh, the covenant with Abram is developed in chapters 15 and 17 of Genesis. In Exodus 24, Moses reads out all of the law and uh, he gets the blood of the sacrificed animals and sprinkles it on the people and on the book. And he said, this is the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you. Now, all of these things are kind of sitting there. They've got their own meaning because God is doing them doing things with them, but they're, they're there, if you like, as figures and reference points for the prophets to use to explain the coming of the Christ. So the servant, Moses, David, their servants, but when the prophets get hold of it, you've got the famous servant songs of Isaiah, Isaiah 49, Isaiah 61, Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me, you know these ones. Um, the kingship is, is quite crucial. And have a look at this. This is 2 Samuel chapter 7. 2 Samuel chapter 7 is a promise made by God to David who has established his kingdom. He's built himself a, a house, a, t a palace. Now he wants to build God a house. He wants to build a proper temple, not a tent anymore. And the Lord says, well, no, I don't want you to do that. Someone else will do that. But the Lord made a promise to David. This is 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse well, 11, I suppose, in the middle there. Verse 12, when your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I'll raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He's the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. How long? forever. I will be his father and he will be my son. When he does wrong, I'll punish him with a rod wielded by men, with floggings inflicted by human hands. But my love will never be taken away from him, as I took it away from Saul. So here's a promise, a key promise picked up in Psalm 89, as you know. And uh, the kingship's theme is really important, Psalm 2, Psalm 110, it's referring back to David and David's descendants, uh, lots of promises to do with kingship, and looking forward to another one who will come later. Um, God being with his people, uh, ex uh, Ezekiel 36 is a place to look. Uh, the famous ones we're going to see at Christmas, like as Isaiah 7, we sang that song tonight, Emmanuel, that's Isaiah 7, but Ezekiel 36, have a look at that. Something different is going to happen. This is Ezekiel 36, 26. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. So although the Lord was living with these people in the tent, moving around while the exodus was going on in the pillar of fire and cloud, now he's going to put his spirit in the people themselves. And the Isaiah 8 reading that we read before, just have a look, go back and look at that for a bit. It's important when you read Isaiah 9 to read Isaiah 8 because although we only read Isaiah 9 at Christmas, it's in the context of the darkness of chapter 8 and the Lord is going to bring his light. But the light that he's going to bring is going to come through this person. Uh, well, here's a bit of a mystery, isn't it? This is chapter 9, verse 6. A child who will govern, who will be called Wonderful Counselor and Mighty God and even called Everlasting Father, 
Uh, there's one for the Trinitarian theologians to grapple with. But uh, some, someone is coming, and this, you see the prophets developing this, that somehow God is going to be with them in a different kind of way than before. This is going to be a human person who can be called the mighty God. Now there's uh, the priesthood I mentioned. The priesthood idea is picked up in a variety of ways. Uh, I think Queenie quoted from it in one of the prayers earlier. Isaiah 53 is, is, a, is a wonderful, as you have a quick look at it, uh, so much in Isaiah 53, but some of it is reflective of the kind of sacrificial um, system that God had set in place. So the sacrifices that were going on all the time in the, pe in the time of the people of Israel, this is picked up at this point, this is Isaiah 53 verse 10, and applied in a future way. In Isaiah 53 10, it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer, and though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. Now there the Lord himself is providing the sin offering through this servant who's being described in chapter 53. And Psalm 110 also refers to the priest. Now the covenant, the covenant's a really important thing. We're, uh, I'm kind of sketching, sketching bits of it tonight, okay? So you'll probably leave frustrated like you did the other nights. Uh, the covenant is another pattern that God has set up getting ready to explain the coming of the Son. So uh, Jeremiah 31 is the great passage that in a sense connects the Old Testament to the New Testament. Uh, the, the, the covenant with Abraham, chapter 12 of Genesis, 15, 17, 22 and so on. The covenant with Moses, uh, which is a development of it, is now going to be replaced. This is Jeremiah 31, 31. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and the people of Judah. It won't be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them. This is the covenant I will make after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it in their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will I teach their neighbour or say to one another, Know the Lord, because they'll all know me. From the least to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. So the law on their heart, sins properly forgiven, knowing the Lord, something in the new covenant is going to do what the old covenant, particularly under Moses, wasn't able to do because of the hardness of the heart. Now, there's a whole lot of other things, all, all sorts of other things we could go through in the Old Testament. Uh, the temple, the tent, the temple, uh, the exodus, the exile, all sorts of things. What I'm, what I'm trying to suggest to you is that in the first place, God sets up these events and patterns and people, and then the prophets use them as a means of describing something that's coming in the future, a future kingdom like David, a future king like David, uh, a future temple like that, but different. Um, uh, a law and a kind of covenant no longer dependent upon the sinfulness of humans, but somehow realized on the inner being of people. A servant, a servant who's coming, who will somehow be God himself. So the imagery is set up, the prophets are using it to tell you what's coming in the future. So when we get to the New Testament, uh, we're into Matthew now. Before Jesus is born, there's still more of what is basically explaining in advance what's going to happen and who this is. So Matthew 1 verse uh, 21, uh, Joseph is told that this child is going to be called Jesus because he'll save his people from their sins. We sang that little song with a play on words to to the Yeshua Old Testament word for Joshua, for Jesus. Verse 23, he's going to be God with us. 
So here's explanations in advance why this baby is different to all the other Bethlehem babies. Uh, over to Luke, who's got the other set of uh, birth narratives. Luke chapter 1, uh, verse 33. We read some of this before. So Mary's told that her baby's going to be the son of the Most High. He's going to have the throne of his father David, reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. There's 2 Samuel 7. See that? Um, chapter 1, verse 72. This is Zechariah, John the Baptist's father, telling us that he's, the Lord is going to show mercy to our ancestors and to remember his holy covenant. Uh, finally, the agreement of their covenant is going to be fulfilled. So that's all in advance. Before the baby's born, there's a huge amount of information pictured and represented by all sorts of patterns and things in advance tells you that something about this child. So when the child is born, at the time of his birth, we've got more explanations. So ch Luke chapter 2, verse 11. This is the, sh the angels and the shepherds. So the child that's born is a saviour, Messiah, Lord. Three big words picking up huge amounts from the Old Testament. At chapter 2, verse 29, this is old man Simeon waiting for the comforting of Israel for, for, into his old age. Sovereign Lord, as you've promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you've prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. So there's Genesis 12, Isaiah 49, Isaiah 61, Isaiah 66. Uh, chapter 2, verse 27 That's not right, is it? Verse 25. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel or the comforting of Israel. And verse 38, the, the old prophet Anna, she is talking and speaking about the child to those who are looking forward to the redemption of, of Jerusalem. So here's all the Old Testament expectations summarised in a couple of words. These two old people have been looking forward to it, praying for it, and now, now they see the baby. How dramatic must have that been? Uh, but the promises are there in the Old Testament. So that's an explanation of what Jesus' coming was about given at the time of his birth. But after he was born... Jesus himself explains a lot of it. So Luke 4, you know this, he, he goes to the synagogue in Nazareth, reads Isaiah 61, he says, today this has been fulfilled in your hearing. Um, in chapter 10 of Luke, there's a bit, bit that looks like it should have been from John's Gospel. No one has ever seen God, only the Son. He's revealing him, so he's explaining something about what he's doing. And then, of course, the apostles get onto it. John writes a whole Gospel about it, particularly John chapter 1. Uh, Acts 2, on the day of Pentecost, Peter gets up and says, this is what this is all about. This is Jesus who, whom you crucified. Um, in Acts 13, Paul does the same thing um, and, and tells them about uh, basically the history of the Old Testament and the history of Jesus and what he's done and how God has used him and he's been crucified, raised, ascended and so on. And then uh, right through the New Testament. So Hebrews 1, verse, the first few verses, you know this. God spoke to our ancestors by many we, in the way in the past. Now he's spoken to us who, through his son. So all through, they're, going, they're looking back now, explaining afterwards what this was all about. So I'm telling you all of that, which you already know, of course, to underline how we know about this stuff. Because lots of Christians... They basically only know what they heard in the last sermon, well, not the whole of the sermon, or, or what they've seen on the internet, or they keep, and so sometimes they just keep repeating things without actually understanding or knowing where it came from. Now, I don't know how long we've been going, probably too long, but we've only sketched a little bit, haven't we? 
Like there's a huge amount. We could go on for days and days and days and days filling out how God in the Old Testament told about what was going to happen. And, and then in the New Testament, like the, the, you, you see it in the, in the Gospel writers, this is to fulfill what the prophets, this is what the prophets said, this is that. And Paul does the same thing. These things are written for our instruction. This is all Old Testament stuff. That was the scriptures. And the more we, the more we read them and understand them, the better we grasp who this person was and why he came and all that. Now we sketched it, and you, and you know a lot of the story anyway, but I want to encourage you to keep reading it and reading it as a, as a big story. It's a big story that has a beginning and a middle and an end. And uh, all of the bits all the way through. So the David and Goliath story, for example, is part of the big story. And, and what God is doing with David and Goliath is saving his people single-handedly, like he did with Moses, like he did with the judges, like he does with Christ. The same story with little variations all the way through. And you understand it because you see it's part of the big story. Now let me come to the end. I've lost my last page, but I know where it is. Colossians chapter 2. We're coming to the end. What are we to make of all this? This person who came, born as a baby, prophesied about a king, the mighty God, Emmanuel, God with us, the one who brought the light, the one who brought redemption and salvation, the one whom God set forward as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. That's Romans 3. Uh, what are we to make of this? How should we serve this person? How should we explain it? Well, here's a long little bit just to finish with. This is Colossians chapter 2, verse 9. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we've not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way. Colossians chapter 2 verse 9. So Colossians chapter 1 verse 9. What did I say? Chapter 2. Oh, I'm glad, you watched. I'm glad you're paying attention. <laughs> Colossians, <laughs> Colossians chapter 1 verse 9. And on the, on, the, on the page of notes that I've lost, it also said chapter 2 verse 9. <laughs> all right, we're all on the same page. All on the same page now. <laughs> all right, we'll start again. Chapter 1 verse 9. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we've not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience and giving joyful thanks to the Father who's qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. For he's rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he's the head of the body, the church. He's the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him, to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. But now he's reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you wholly in his sight without blemish and free from accusation if you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard 
and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven, and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. Well, that's quite a good summary of the whole thing, isn't it? Mm -hmm. He's redeemed us, rescued us, to present us holy in his sight, if you continue in your faith, established and firm, with the power to persevere. Let's stop and be quiet for a moment. <clears throat>